wants to join me here. Love to have you. All right, please welcome, help me in welcoming Dr. Tobin Pieper. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about another berry disease, uh, gray mold. Um, and this work has been, my program's a little unusual because I have, like Delphi mentioned, she's based here, permanently based here. I'm based in Pullman, but I come over here periodically. We've got a lab here, we've got a lab in Pullman. So some of this, this work described all, did, we, did some, we did sampling throughout this area, but a lot of the assays for resistance were done in, in Pullman. And so I go back and forth between the two two locations. So it's a little bit unusual setup. And this has been about three, I've been at this about three years now. So I used to work uh, on legume diseases in, in Pullman and then transitioned to working on, on small fruit pathology about three years ago. So it's, um, it's, been, it's been very interesting. And I guess we're, Sorry. that's okay. Technology is really great when it works. <laughs> okay, so as I said, so this work has um, been facilitated, so David Dutton um, has done most of the, the assays that I'll talk about, so the resistance assays, and he's, he's in the lab and works in the lab in Pullman. Uh, Delphi, you just heard from, she's been involved in this project as well with sampling and doing some of the resistance assays over here. I have a graduate student, Olga Kozar, I think some of you might have met her. She's working on gray mold as well, but more kind of the biological end and trying to understand the infection process of raspberry as well as uh, looking at um, questions of how far the pathogen moves. So we had a question about how far these spores move. Uh, host specificity, so do we see different populations on raspberries versus blueberries, questions like that. So I've been primarily responsible for the fungicide resistance aspect of the program that we started, as I said, about three years ago. Um, I've been working with the people in British Columbia as well, so Siva Sabaratnam, who's BC Ministry of Ag, he's facilitated sampling in British Columbia, so we now have a really nice sample of Botrytis isolates from British Columbia, from Washington, and also from Oregon. So, working with Virginia Stockwell, who's the new USDA uh, scientist, um, she's been working on gray mold as well in, in Corvallis. So, we now have a nice, we have a very good idea, I think, about fungicide resistance in Botrytis scenario throughout this whole region, throughout the Pacific Northwest. And the fundings come from several sources. So, the Washington Red Raspberry Commission, Blueberry Commission. Washington State Commission on Pesticide Registration. Uh, we got a block grant from the state for specialty crops. That's facilitated a lot of this work and also from the BC uh, Blueberry Council. And I just like, again, like Delphi mentioned to thank, I think some of you may, we may have sampled from some of your farms. We've had great cooperation from growers to facilitate sampling of, um, from, from farms throughout the area. Uh-oh. I don't think this is advancing. I have to do it manually. That'll work. Okay. So I'll just give you a little orientation of the disease cycle. So this disease, so Delphi gave a very nice introduction to the mummy berry pathogen. This pathogen is really quite different in a lot of ways. Um, and one is that <clears throat> it colonizes a lot of different organic. Okay. Lots of different organic debris. So it can colonize senescent plant, lots of different senescent plant material. This fungus has a very wide host range. So in contrast to the fungus that Dalphy talked about, it's very specific for blueberry. This fungus colonizes lots of different fruit. You've all seen it in your refrigerator, colonizing raspberries, but other, lots of other fruit, right? It causes this gray, fuzzy growth on the surface. You've, you've all seen it. It's got a wide host range. So it's very, really quite different in terms of its host range, its biology is really quite different. It's, it's simpler, so the life cycle is, is quite a bit simpler. So it colonizes lots of different organic debris, so lots of senescent tissues. It can infect dead plant tissue. It can, it can infect live plant tissue. Um, produces these, this one type of spore, so it's canidia. So Delphi talked about two different spore types. She talked about ascospores. Then canidia, so that fungus produces two different spore types. This one just one, so that latter type, canidia. Okay? And it's a canidia that produced on these little tree-like structures, the canidia fours. 
Okay, and that causes, so when you have enough of those and concentrated on the surface of the fruit, that's what gives it that gray appearance, and that's where the name of the disease comes from, gray mold. Okay, they're wind disseminated. Um, so the student in the lab, Olga, she's trying to understand this infection process of ras ras raspberry. But what, the way that we think about the disease now is it colonizes the flowers as they open. Basically, um, penetrates to a certain extent in those flowers, but then becomes late, sits there for a while. Okay? As the fruit develops, matures, then you start to see the fungus emerging from that, from within that flower. So the way that we think about this disease is it colonizes the flowers as they open, sits in the flowers, as the fruit develops, then you start to, then you start to see it again. So the strategies for control then are to protect those flowers, okay? So, we, so fungicide sprays are targeted at those flowers to try and prevent infection of the flowers and then the subsequent infection that you see externally on the fruit later in the season, right? We have some questions about that. We don't really understand how well that, how it actually works in raspberry. We have some questions now whether these, all the infections that you see at the end of the season at harvest really result from infection of flowers, okay? There's a possibility that you can have infection, direct infection of fruit later on in the season as well. And so we think there's some alternative routes to get this, this sort of end result, the disease that you see in the field, okay? But I won't talk about that today. Olga's, Olga's talked about it. Um, she'll be presenting more on that later. Um, so anyway, so the, the idea is then to protect these young flowers. So this is our management strategies now, protect those flowers, prevent this infection process. So you can see it's a much simpler life cycle than the, the omniberry pathogen, single spore type, colonizes lots of different plant material, can overwinter on that plant material. So we think of, of having, there's a lot of inoculum out there, so initiating the disease from a lot of different sources, it's always present, okay? What we do know from infection studies in the lab is that it requires about 18 hours at about 20 degrees Celsius, which is 68 Fahrenheit, for an infection process to occur, okay? So it's a relatively low temperature, so it's a cool season, disease, requires free moisture, okay, but these temper this temperature is relatively low. What we're seeing is that we're having trouble when we want, want to try to create the disease in the field, when the temperatures are relatively high, we can apply a lot of moisture and we can't create the disease, okay? So temperature seems to be really important. That's one thing we've learned from some of our epidemiological studies. Okay, so this is supposed to work now. So that's kind of the over, that's the, that's the disease cycle. Um, before I started this, this work, um, Alan Schreiber, uh, Steve Midbow, and some other, and some industry people had initiated a study of fungicide resistance in this area. They had sent some samples. Uh, Jim Adaskavich, who's at University of California Riverside, did some initial assays. So we already had some indication that there were problems with fungicide resistance in this pathogen in this area. Um, the, fun, the, the fungicides that we focused on are listed here. Okay? So these are the common fungicides that are used to control this disease in berries. I've listed the trade names here, as well as the active ingredients. I'll refer to the active ingredients um, as I go through the talk. I've listed the frac groups, okay? So Delphi mentioned for uh, the mummy berry pathogen, the different frac groups that are used at different times in the season. So with mummy berry, it's frac group three materials. Early in the season, they're more effective against that pathogen, followed by other frac materials from other frac groups later on. And frac groups really important. So we really stress um, knowing what frac group that the fungicide is, is in is important because in general, all members of a frac group have the same mode of action. Okay, so if you have resistance that develops to any member of that frac group, you expect cross resistance to, the, to any other member of that frac group. So if you have resistance problems to a material such as frac group 17, if you have resistance to elevate, you cannot replace it with another fungicide from frac group 17 because the fungus will be resistant to it as well. Okay, so frac group's really important. Here's the modes of action of these. So there's different modes of action in the fungal cell, okay? So some of them 
inhibit things like sterile biosynthesis and importance in cell membranes, ability to regulate in their environment, produce uh, amino acids and so forth. Okay. Some of the fungicides we use um, are mixtures. So for example, switch, so many of you are familiar with this, as a mixture of saprotonyl and fludioxanil, they're in different groups. Okay, so what we do for these assays then is to pull those two components apart to, to test the, the sensitivity to each component of the mixture. So we, we test, we pull, we test to um, saprotonyl and fludioxanil separately. Pristine's also um, uh, has two components. The other, the other component does not have activity against gray mold, so we haven't tested it. The primary um, fungicide with activity in pristine is bosquid, and so we tested that separate from the pristine mixture as well. Okay, so with these mixtures make it a little bit more complicated to understand resistance if you have resistance to one, mech, to one component but not the other and how effective those might be in the field to make a prediction about that. If you have a you know, multi-component mixture versus a single, a single component. So those are the fungicides that we've, that we've focused on. The assay is pretty straightforward. Um, so all of, our, all of the data that I'll show you is based on this kind of assay. Okay? So we're basically testing how well the fungus grows in culture, so in a Petri dish. So we have these, petri, these plastic Petri dishes, fill it with a solid medium that the fungus likes to grow on. Um, and we have these paired uh, plates, basically, one with the fungicide, sorry, one without the fungicide, one with the fungicide. We can put uh, multiple individuals, so this is four different isolates of the pathogen here. And these are the same four in the same orientation on this plate here with the fungicide incorporated into the growth medium, okay? So you can see the responses. So when we grow in the absence of the uh, fungicide, this is, and this is a, typically about two days after we initiate, you put, take one of these plugs, take it from a plate, put it on, allow it to grow, and then measure the, the extent of that growth after a two day period. So you can see how well they grow here, and then if you compare over here, you can see that this particular isolate here is quite inhibited by the, by the fungicide. Okay. This one a little bit less so, so there's a little bit of reduction in growth relative to here. These two isolates really aren't affected much by the presence of the fungicide at all. Okay. So in, in this way we can estimate a sensitivity to that, to that fungicide. So we can classify these isolates as sensitive or insensitive and everything in between. By doing this too, what we can do is we just, so all of the data that I'll show you is basically estimating the, per, the amount of growth here relative to the amount of growth here as a percentage or as a proportion. Okay, so if it grows 70 or 80% of the control versus 10 or 20% of the control, one's much less sensitive than the other. So that's all the, that's the basis of all the data. We've also looked at things like spore germination. So we measured, we can put Canadia onto these plates, measure how well they germinate in the early stages of growth as well. And this is, this is what you get. So when you take um, a series of isolates, so these are ordered by fields, so we go into different fields, berry fields, sample about 10 to 15 isolates per field, okay? Run them through this, the assay, test them against the different fungicides, so this is the, the kind of data that we generate. So proportion growth of control. So how well does it grow in the fungicide relative to the absence of the fungicide, okay? So you can see there's a, there's a whole series of strain of isolates. So this is several hundred, okay, in different fields, group by field. You can see a whole series up here that really aren't inhibited much by the fungicide at all, okay? They're growing basically close to 100%. There's a series down here that are quite inhibited, so about less than 20% or so. And then some intermediate types. And this is very typical of what we see. So all these fungicides, we basically see this, what we call a bimodal distribution, okay? So you'll see a sensitive type, you'll see a less sensitive type, and sometimes an intermediate type. So the question then is trying to relate this assay, so that how well the fungus grows in this Petri dish, to the performance of the fungicides in the field, okay? Because that's the, that's the question we want to know. We want to know, are, which of these 
isolates is resistant to this particular fungicide in the field, okay? So we know how well it grows to say saprodinyl, so that's one component of the switch mixture at one part per million, okay? But how well does it really, how well does it perform in the field? That's the question. So is saprodinyl effective against these, these strains up here, these strains down here, the ones in the middle? What do you think? Any of those resistant? We call field resistant? High probability. High probability. So these guys up here? So that's the question we asked. And so in order to do that, we had to develop a, a fruit, protect, what we call a fruit protection assay, okay? So that's the question is, can we take this data and say, we know that these are less sensitive to the fungicide in a Petri dish, okay, than these ones, but are they resistant? So can we treat fruit with field rates of the fungicide and protect that fruit from the pathogen, okay? That way we can relate the two things together. So that's what we've done. So this is the assay we've developed. Um, so we take raspberries that we purchase from the grocery store. We can protect them with field rates of the fungicide. So we estimate the field rates, the weight rates at which are used, assume a certain gallonage per acre, treat them. Okay, so we surface sterilize the berries and we treat them with the fungicide. So those are the protected ones here. And then these are the non-protected, so the controls basically. We surface sterilize them, okay? Leave them unprotected with a fungicide. And then we inoculate the very tip of the, the berries, okay? So we know that the, where the infection starts, because we, when we take a known concentration of the canidia, of the spores, put them on the surface, and then allow it to grow over a period of time. We monitor and see what happens. Okay, so what we did was to um, select isolates that grew various percentages on this, on the one part per million. So we might select, we selected an isolate that would say grow 30 to 35%, say that one. We could select one down here. We could select one up in this range, say 75% of growth. And we could take one that's, that's basically not affected by the fungicide at all. And ask the question, translate that to the fruit assay, and ask the question, can we protect the fruit from those strains, okay? And those are the strains here. So here's one that grew 40%, 76%, 95%, okay? So this is at day two. So this is two days after the, the tips of those berries were inoculated. And then we also left some of these berries uninoculated. Okay, so just didn't treat them at all. Okay, here's day three. So you can see the unprotected, they're showing a lot more disease than the protected in general. Okay, you're starting to see some differentiation here between the 40%, the growth, the isolate that grew 40% on one part per million saprodinil. Isn't, it looks like it's being, the fruit are being protected from that strain, but not so much from these ones. Okay, there's day four. So this, through this kind of data, so we're still protecting these, these strains. So this data allows us to draw a line between taking that data and say, above this particular percentage growth in a Petri dish, we can't expect that to, we cannot control those, or we predict we can't control those isolates in the field, okay? So our resistance cutoff then is somewhere between this 40 and this 76%, okay? The other interesting thing about this, if you look up here, is that in the uninoculated berries, we're still getting some disease. So there's internal infections in these berries when we buy them from the grocery store. And the interesting thing that we've noticed in this, so we can generally differentiate the, the disease that we see where we inoculated because we know exactly where we put it on the berry, versus infections that come out from other parts of the berry, okay? Sometimes they grow together and we can't distinguish them, we have, to, we have to throw that data out. But the interesting thing to me is, look at the difference between the non-protected, uninoculated berries and those that were protected and uninoculated, okay? So it means that we can, with the fungicide, is actually protecting from these internal infections, okay? And it's not really how we think about plant diseases, in general, we think about the fungicide having to be there long before the fungus arrives, okay, to protect plant tissue. 
but in some, but it looks like it's suppressing these internal infections, which is pretty interesting, I think, when you think about how sprays are used to protect fruit, like, like raspberries, late season sprays and so on. Yeah. How did you surface green beans to start with? They, what we do is we do a really quick dip in a, in a ethanol solution and then a very weak bleach, bleach solution for about a minute. And that's a really standard sort of way of cleaning up the surfaces of plant tissue. You have to be careful with bleach with soft tissues like these because um, bleach, you know, bleach kills the plant tissue too. And so you, we've played around with sort of the different lengths of time for, for treating. But it's basically to get rid of the surface, as much of the surface contamination we can. Yeah, Tom. Do you think that the brightest needs surface moisture in order to move from one sequence to another? Do you need to travel on the surface of the fruit to go from one medium to another? Probably not. I think it could move from one to the other from within. Um, that's a possibility, though. I think in strawberries, that's what they think is one of the more common mechanisms because you have. Um, like some of the, the uh, subtending leaves and so on that, that you can have movement. If you have that infected, it can move from that to the berry with, in a droplet of water. So it's possible, I think, through on the surface too. So we're applying the canidia to the surface of the plant or to the surface of these fruits or right on the, on the tips of these in a droplet of, of water. So they need free water to infect. We know that with this pathogen. Okay. So this is our sampling then for uh, over the past three years. Uh, so in 2014 is basically when we started. We had a fairly limited sample just basically from Raspberry and Whatcom County, 13 fields. We had some fields from British Columbia sampled in that year. But 2015 is when we really expanded our sampling. And a lot of this was um, my students Olga's project. She's very interested in looking at the specificity of different botrytis populations on different berry crops. And so she sampled a much wider, we sampled a much wider range of crops. So we sampled strawberries, blackberries, we sampled wild Himalayan blackberries as well, and currants and so forth. So much, much larger sample in 2015. And then in 2016, it was scaled back a little bit. We tried to go back to some of the same fields that we had sampled earlier. So we have an, an idea like through time, how fungicide resistance might change through time. Some go back to some of the same fields. So overall now, I think we're starting to put together, we've got a pretty good picture of fungicide resistance in Botrytis on berries across the Pacific Northwest. Okay, so this, I'll just show an example from raspberry in 2015. The results for raspberry were pretty similar to blueberry. Um, Strawberry is a little bit interesting situation, but in general, I think the results from raspberry you can apply to blueberry. They're pretty much the same. So I'll show you just this raspberry as an example. So our sampling in 2015, we had four fields from Skagit, six fields from Whatcom, so about 100 total. So, so it's about 10, 10 isolates per field. That's generally sample, sample about 10 to 15. And we tried to target fields from farms where different management strategies were being employed. So we knew that, um, that sort of more or less fungicide treatments were being applied. And so we characterized those ones with fewer fungicide inputs as low input. Conventional systems have, have higher uh, numbers of sprays. And you can see, so these are the, the fields in Skagit are in blue, the fields in Whatcom are in black. And you can see that these low input systems were in this county versus the conventional we're, we're in, we're in Whatcom. And we wanted to be able to relate those fungicide inputs to the resistance that we see, okay? And so this is just, these are the results. So the, the fungicides where we have resistance problems, and we knew this going in from the work of um, Jim Atascavich, is that fenhexamid, so that's the um, that's Elevate, Boscolid, that's one component of Pristine, Ciprodinol, that's the other, that's one component of Switch. That's where we have our problems, okay? Iperdione and Flutioxanil, the other component of Switch, we have no evidence for resistance to either of those materials yet. 
Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm just, I'll show you some other data for those, but we're not really focused on those when we think about resistance. Um, so here we have the four fields from Skagit, the fields from Whatcom, okay. Um, the solid portions of the bars are the isolates that are sensitive, okay. The hatch portions of the bars are resistant. So through that fruit assay that I showed you, we were able to classify isolates as sensitive or resistant. So the resistant portions are the, are the hatch, they add up to 100, so we're taking a percentage of those 10 to 15 isolates that are in the sensitive category or in the resistant category, okay? All right, so what you can see is that there's a lot of variation, so these are individual fields, okay? Each bar is an individual field. These are the averages here, so about half of isolates on average for in Raspberry and Washington are resistant to these three materials, okay? But you can also see that there's a lot of variation field to field, okay? So that's one thing we've learned is that there's a huge variation from field to field, even fields that are next door to each other, okay? So for example, this field here, 100% resistance, this field here, 100% sensitive, and everything in between. And basically for the same pattern for each of the, each of the materials. Lots of variation. Some fields, very high frequency of all, to all three, like here, okay. What's the other pattern that pops out at you here? Richard wants to say something. Yeah, exactly, all right? Those are the low inputs. Okay, so that's the other thing we've learned is that there's a, there's, when you look across all this, this data, there's a very strong correlation between the fungicide inputs and the resistance that we see, okay? Which is, is it's totally expected because when you're spraying fungicides and you're spraying them multiple times, you're selecting very, very strongly for resistant members of that population, okay? So they're gonna build up. And so we see this over and over again. We've seen this strong, whoops, whoops, whoops. I'm doing good. What happened there? What did I do? I got a black slide. Okay. <laughs> Push the wrong buttons. Um, so we see this, this really strong correlation. So you can see that there's much, that the rates of sensitive isolates, the frequencies of sensitive isolates are much higher in these lower, lower input fields. Okay, so two things we learned. So one, we've seen um, very strong correlation between the inputs and resistance. The other thing is very strong differentiation on a local scale. So even fields right next to each other can have very different frequencies of resistance, which raises really interesting questions about how far the fungus moves, okay? And these are questions that, that Olga's dealing, that is gonna try and answer in the next couple of years. Okay, so I said we didn't have any evidence for problems to, with resistance to fludioxanil or iperdione. Iperdione's an interesting story because we had resistance problems 17 years ago, okay? Fungus, this this, this um, fungicide's been reintroduced. So what happened is the resistance strains that we had 17 years ago basically went away when we stopped using iperdione, okay? because of fitness costs associated with that resistance. So you stop using the chemical, frequency resistance declines, and we can use it again 17 years later, okay? So in fludioxanil, we have no evidence for resistance, and this is similar to what people see in other places. So in Europe, other parts of North America, no evidence for resistance to fludioxanil, okay? So switch, if it's a mixture of saprodinil and fludioxanil, in situations where you've got high frequencies of saprodinyl resistance in your field, switch is functioning as a single product fungicide, as far as we can tell, okay? So, but if we look at the mean, and so this is just a little different way of presenting the data. So instead of classifying them as sensitive or resistant, we just calculate a mean, okay? So how well do they grow on that single concentration? And this, what I've done here is to break out, so we've got the different crops, so here's strawberry, blackberry, blueberry, and raspberry, this is all from 2015 sampling. I broke out the low input farms, so there's um, different crops within 
in here. So, so these were pulled out basically. So these are all the conventional. This is the low input. These are these wild populations. So these are the Himalayan blackberries that we sampled. So they get the disease too. We assume they're not sprayed. Okay, so we think it represents a nice sort of baseline sensitivity level that we can look at. So if we <clears throat> draw a line across there through make the mean of the these wild populations, untreated populations, you can see that the low input, so let's look at fluoxino first, is about the same. Okay. But then you look across here, so even though we don't have what we consider resistant isolates to fluvioxanil, you can see that the, the mean insensitivity has increased. Okay? So the selection, there is still selection there for this low level of insensitivity across. And the same pattern for ipridione. Okay? So it's just, I think, pretty interesting. So again, this evidence that, you know, basically these populations respond to fungicide treatment. So you treat them, you may get, you may get relatively low, you know, low insensitivities that may not be compromised the control of the, the chemical, but it's still there. It's still increasing, in sense, the insensitive, insensitivity is increasing. Okay, so just to summarize, this is um, from 2014 to 5th through 15. So I grouped all the raspberries here so you can see and to the three chemicals, so phenhexamine in blue, um, boscolid in red, saprodinol in green. So Washington raspberries in 2014, and then included the British Columbia samples here. So British Columbia 2014, two regions in 15, and then the blueberries are here, blackberries and strawberries. Okay. So strawberries are really interesting to me because in general, the, and this is just again frequency of resistance here, Okay, frequency of resistant types. Strawberries are interesting because the frequencies of resistant look quite a bit lower. And I don't really have an explanation for that because the data that we've seen where we gathered fungicide spray records, and it's fairly limited so far, it looks like strawberries are being sprayed as much. But it, the frequencies of resistance are, are markedly lower than we see in these other crops, which I think is really interesting. Um, you can see some, in some cases, we've got very high frequencies of resistance. So, for example, British Columbia blueberry growers have very high frequencies of bosclid and saprodinyl resistance. Okay. And so some of those fields, they've got very high, basically 100% resistance to all three, all three of these materials, which really limits the control options for, for those growers. Okay. Um, the other thing we've been doing, so I said we've been gathering spray records. So um, we've been, the, the growers that have cooperated with us, that have, we went into their fields and sampled, we've gone back and asked for spray records to try and relate the, the frequencies of resistance that we see to the inputs, to the fungicide inputs. So when we going in, we had some general idea that, yeah, this grower is using fewer fungicides than, than another one, but we wanted to actually quantify that, okay? So we've gotten some of that data. So this is fairly preliminary, but it, it gives, it's, I think it's pretty interesting. So we've got the, whoops, 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 I don't wanna do that. Um, the frequency of resistant isolates over here, okay? So this is for fenhexamid, bosclid, and saprodinol. And then what we did was go back to about, if we can, about five or six years previous to the sampling date, okay? So if we sampled a field in 2015, we try to go and get spray records back to about 2009 or 10, something like that, okay? And then estimate an average number of sprays of each of these materials over that time span, okay? As a predictor for resistance. And so what you can see is that as we might expect, there's a positive relationship for all three. So as you increase the number of sprays, you select for more resistant strains, okay? Um, <clears throat> Phenhexamine is an interesting case because that's been voluntarily withdrawn in 2013 from use um, in this area. So we, most, most places are, if we go back in the data, the, 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 amount, the number of sprays is, is relatively low compared to some of these others. So you see that there's about, up to about one spray per season, Bosca a little, little bit more, two to two and a half on average, but then there's quite a bit of switch use 
three and three to four sprays on average per year. Okay. So what's interesting to me too, so you see this general increase, which you'd expect, but the interesting thing to me are these points that are off this line. So for example, here, okay? So basically about, on average, about a third of a spray per year of fenhexamide, but 100% resistance, okay? Con contrast to this point down here, over one spray per season, no resistance at all. Those are really interesting to me because I don't have an explanation for them, okay? <clears throat> Same here. So you have some with relatively few sprays of boscolate or pristine sprays, but 100% resistance here, okay? I think what might be going on here, and I'll show you some, some data for this, is that the way that this fungus reproduces, basically, if you have resistance, if you have a mutation to any one of these fungicides that's present in the population, you can select by any one of those other fungicides, you can select resistance indirectly to that material. Okay, so it's in the population, the fungus reproduces, all those other mutations get pulled along. Okay, so you have resistance to all three of them, but you may be only spraying one of them. And so, looking at each fungicide individually may not give you the whole story because that mutation may have been present early on for phenhexamid resistance. It gets pulled to high frequency simply by using pristine, okay? Um, and so that's what I've been thinking about lately is this, mul this idea about multiple resistance. So asking the question, so we can look at each of those fungicides individually, but then we can ask, well, what about how many of these isolates are resistant to two of those fungicides? Okay, any combinations of two, or any combina or all three? And that's what we, what we see here. So this is a field, this is raspberry. Um, so I just started to look at this. I think the patterns will be similar for other crops, or botrytis from other crops. But you can see different fields. So these are different fields that we've sampled. Okay, so in some cases you have this very, you have very low frequencies of resistance. So this is a proportion of resistant isolates again. Sometimes it's very high, okay, everything in between. Here's the mean across all here. So on average, I said about 50% resistance. But look at, so here are the different combinations. So what happens when we ask, well, how many of those isolates are resistant to phenhexamide and boscolid, phenhexamide, ciprodinil, and so forth, and how many resistant all three? And turns out there's a lot. So on average, about 30 to 40% of these isolates in any given field are multiply resistant. Okay? So I think that might explain why you see this. In some cases, a, a, far, a grower may not have used a particular fungicide, but he or she might have high frequencies of resistance to it. Okay? Simply because they're multiply resistant, it gets pulled along. <clears throat> so this is something we hope to explore in a little more detail in the future. All right, so let's, let's just go through the conclusion. So we don't see any evidence of highly insensitive or resistant isolates to fluidioxin or iprodion to date. We are monitoring these, but we haven't seen any evidence for it. This is similar, the fluidioxinal situation is similar to what other people have seen. They've not found resistance. There's some indication in tree fruit and in, in storage, um, post-harvest situation, we might start to be starting to see fluidioxinal resistance, but generally not. Um, but we have detected resistance to three of these five materials that are commonly used. Okay. Some have, some growers have high frequencies to all three, which greatly limits the options for control. Um, so we need to reduce selection. And it's pretty clear we have this correlation between the inputs and resistance. So we need to lower the amount of selection, which means using them less. Uh, we see large variations field to field. So we're starting to think that botrytis populations are quite local. We, we used to think about, or our, I certainly used to think about botrytis as sort of this large population everywhere, every, you know, on every crop. And I don't think that's really, the, that's really what's happening. They're quite local. Um, we see this clear correlation between the use. So if you're using more fungicides, you select for resistance. Uh, this frequency of multiple resistance is high, and this seems to be higher than what other people have observed. And people in California are seeing about 
multiple resistance. So we may have significantly higher frequencies of multiply resistant isolates. So we need to reduce selection. So we need to reduce the use of the fungicides, limit the, the amount used from any one of those classes, the frac groups. Also, wherever possible, integrate it with other control measures. Okay? So that's really the strategy. So in terms of management, actual management, we certainly need to monitor fields and we're doing that. We need a higher throughput way to monitor fields. So the, the downside of learning that there's a lot of variation locally is it means we need to sample more fields. And so we need to do it in a cheaper way than we're currently doing it because we can't, we can't afford to sample everyone's field, which is what, we look, what it looks like we need to do. So we need a higher throughput, less expensive way to do it because <clears throat> every field is likely different. Um, so we need to reduce selection pressure, so paying attention to frac groups, minimizing the use of materials from any one of those frac groups, very important. We need to alternate their use okay, through time, through the season. Um, strongly trying to stress that the that frac group's really important. Know the frac group of the materials you're using. Don't the trade names, the chemical names don't mean anything. You need to know it. frac group is everything. Okay? Frac group is tells you what you need to know in terms of resistance management. Um, the other strategy that we know works is to mix these, what we call these, all these fungicides are what we call site specific. So it means they're very specific in the fungal cell. They have a very specific mode of action, which is good because they have fewer non-target effects on other organisms, but it means the fungus can evolve resistance easily too. And so mixing these with uh, fungicides with a, broad, with a broader mode of action, okay, is, a fat, is very effective as a, a resistance management strategy. So that should be employed where possible. Um, and also alternative control measures. So anything that you can do to reduce disease pressure through other means, okay. The list is fairly limited with, with this disease and berries, but um, wherever possible, it's, it's a good thing to do. Um, and part of this is we can, I think we can use fewer of these fungicides, manage resistance, reduce costs by knowing more about the biology of the system. Okay, and so that's really one of our other major goals is trying to understand part of Olga's work, understanding the infection process is so that we can use fungicides more when they're needed rather than on a calendar basis. So same idea that, that Delphi was talking about, trying to move away from calendar based applications. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? You have seven minutes. Seven minutes. So I'll just introduce this. Um, so this is kind of our latest <coughs> work. Uh, any questions about that part first before we move on? Yeah. Um, yeah. So even though, if I understand correctly, even though the um, frat groups can have a very specific and different mode of action, resistance to one will drag along resistance to others. Yeah. Right. So the question is, um, Resistance to any one of those frac groups will drag along resistance to the other. So they're in different frac groups. So it's a little different process. So with frac group, all the chemical, the chemistry is the same. The mode of action is the same. So for example, if we had another fungicide in, in frac group 17 with fenhexamide resistance, and you have high frequency of fenhexamide resistance in your field, you cannot replace it with that other frac 17 material because they're resistant. The process I'm talking about with multiple resistance is a little bit different because it's basically a function of how the fungus grows. So the resistances are independent, they're in different parts of the genome of the fungus, but they all get pulled along just because of the way the fungus reproduces. So it's nothing to do with the chemistry of the frat group at all, it's just the way that the reproduction occurs. And so you can have, basically it's like thinking, we call it hitchhiking selection. So another part of the genome comes along for the ride with with the part of the genome that's getting selected. And so the whole genome gets selected in this organism. And, and the products that come pre, pre mixed, um, there doesn't seem to be any synergistic effect between them to help counter that. Okay, so the question is synergistic effects between the components of mixtures. 
It's a good question. We don't really know much about it. You know, and, and part of the problem is we think that switch is still effective, even though it looks like in a case where you had lots of saprodinyl resistance, it would be functioning as a single polydeoxinyl product. But presumably there's other reason, you know, there's reasons for putting that particular mixture together because you have a different spectrum of activity against different pathogens. But we don't know very much about how that, that might work. But we, the way I think starting to think about Flutiox, and we can actually test that in our fruit assay. We're trying to separate those two and see, you know, can switch still, still function to protect fruit um, from these, you know, resistance. If it's saprodinyl resistance, does the switch still work? And so that's something we'll be testing. Yeah, good questions. Yeah. Okay. Right. I don't think we know, you know. Oh, sorry. So the, the question is these tank, these mixtures, fungicide mixtures, I guess it's really this question of whether there's some kind of synergy between them. And I think part of the, you know, the mixture, the mixture aspect is interesting because this idea that it might hide resistance, right? So we don't really know if, if you have saprodinyl resistance and if switch is functioning as a standalone fluvioxinal mixture, the only way you'd really know is to go out and spray switch and a standalone fluvioxinal side by side and see how you do. You know, and so part, and part of the problem we have now is that for about, you know, for the three years I've been working in, uh, and Tom can testify to this, we had really low botrytis years. So these fungicides really haven't been tested recently. And we're very worried that if we do have another botrytis year like we did in 2012, that we, have, we could have some massive problems. So we don't really know, you know, people have been spraying switch the last three years and okay, you know, we're not getting much botrytis in the field, but they really haven't been tested either. So it's a really good question. We don't, the synergy, I think a lot of these mixtures, you know, they're created to, by companies to kind of expand the, the target populations, you know, so fludioxinol might work better against this particular pathogen versus another one and where sort of botrytis fits in there. <coughs> no, don't know. The point of spraying after bloom? To protect flowers from infection. So the way we think about that this pathogen infects is through flowers. That's the route of infection that we think of at this point in time based on previous data. That's how we think Botrytis really infects fruit. I have some questions about that and that's what we're working on. We think some infections might come in later on, direct infections of fruit and so on, but the way we think about Botrytis, and most of this work's been done in strawberry, and strawberry may be fundamentally different than say raspberry, but we think of flowers as the major route of infection, so the general rule is when you have five to 10% bloom, you should be spraying to protect those flowers from botrytis. So that's the kind of current management strategy. Yeah, yeah you showed um, that the resistance level in strawberry were a lot lower. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could be because of the shorter lifespan of the I think that's a possibility, I think. And that's one thing I don't know much about in the areas. Oh, sorry, so why, the question is why we're seeing lower frequencies of resistance in strawberry. And could it be related to the relatively short lifespan of the crop um, relative to these perennial crops, right? And I think there, that could be a good possibility. And so knowing sort of where those plants are coming from, the, the nursery plants are coming from and the source and so forth, because I think in strawberry in Florida and also in California, they think a lot of their resistance problems with botrytis are established in the nurseries. Okay, so it's the so it's very important sort of how those nursery plants, if they're sprayed a lot, then you're basically importing a resistance problem before you even begin. And so I think that could be part of it. That maybe there was because of this turnover, there could be higher turnover of botrytis on strawberry. That's one good possibility actually. 
but it is it is interesting. We don't have much data from we don't have many spray records for strawberry yet, but the ones that I do have, it looks like strawberries are sprayed about as much as these other crops. So it doesn't appear like there's a huge difference in amount of fungicide that's used, at least the ones that I've looked at. So, looks like that took all my time. So I'll have to leave that for later. So this is, this is basically, we're looking at the frac group seven and so, so boscolid resistance, some alternatives to boscolid resistance. There are new materials um, coming along in frac group seven, but it, they are not cross resistant to boscolid. So they're very interesting. They're way, uh, potentially a way of controlling boscolid resistance strains. So it's very encouraging. So any other questions for you? Quint? Yeah, one more. Sure. So the very bottom one. Mm -hmm. We're going to deal with global warming as a step. Mm -hmm. That's what you're referring to there. Not specifically, just that you know most of our disease control. So the question is, does the bottom part refer to global warming, and so may, may that change our frequency of applications of fungicides and Really, no, I mean, what I'm referring to there is that most of our disease control recommendations for lots of, different, for most of our crops actually, are based on a calendar basis. So people, for example, with botrytis on raspberries, you'll start spraying at 5%, 10% bloom and continue all the way through to harvest, okay? So the question is really, is that the appropriate timing? Can we, can we improve on that timing? Can we reduce the number of sprays that are required if we, if we know more about the biology of, say, how the fungus infects and things like the environment, how that affects the disease. So if we know more, if we, we basically could eliminate sprays when we don't need them. So that's really, that's what's that idea. And so that's the emphasis, and that's what Delphi was talking about too with mummy berry is rather than start spraying when the plants are at a certain developmental stage, it'd be better if we knew more about when that when the pathogen was producing spores, and that's what she's been focused on. So putting those two together and relating that to the environment of how infection occurs, we can maybe delay, we can reduce a spray or two. So in systems where people have been able, you know, there, there are cases where we've been able to reduce sprays significantly um, by knowing more about the biology. And so that's really the objective of all this. And, and it has an added side effect of if, you don't use as many fungicides, you're, you're obviously saving money through the app, you know, you're doing fewer applications, but you're also having potential effect on resistance because you're spraying fewer of any one material, right? So, but global, it's, global warming is an interesting question. People, plant pathologists have thought about it and some diseases are gonna increase, some are gonna decrease, depend, and because you're gonna have such different effects in different regions, you know, some are gonna experience more rainfall, and so forth. So the disease spectrum may change quite a bit in different regions as the earth warms. Can you explain what frac group is and where you Oh, sure. Sure. So, yes. Uh, the question is what is frac and where do you find information about frac? So, frac is the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. So, it's an international committee and it's made up of industry people, academics, uh, pe anyone who's interested in fungicide resistance. And so they have different, uh, they have people um, kind of responsible for different working groups. So there'll be, for example, like FRAC Group 17 has a represent, might have a representative from buyer or company or something like that. And they compile research that's related, so they try and figure out, okay, where's been the latest reports of resistance to that particular frac group? And it's all, there's a website, there's a frac website, and has a very nice list of all these materials. And so that's where people can go and, and look at the, you know, the material it says on the label, but know, you know, knowing what that frac group is and kind of relating that to the other fungicides that are used is really important, so, okay. Let's give Kelvin a big round of applause. Thanks. Good to have you.